Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, Episode 11, Australia. Welcome to the land down under, our first country in Oceania, our first Pacific country, and the one and only country that is also its own continent. Kind of, sort of. Australia is located in the region, and sometimes considered continent, known as Oceania, which is pretty much all those island countries in the Pacific. Australia is located at the western edge of that, with Indonesia and Papua New Guinea to its north, the Indian Ocean to the west, the Southern Ocean to, can you guess it? It's the south, New Zealand to the southeast, and the Solomon Islands and Vanuatu to the northeast. Climate-wise, Australia is often thought of as just a huge desert full of kangaroos and emus. However, Australia is relatively diverse climate-wise. While the outback is present in much of the middle of the country, it also has grasslands surrounding the outback, tropical areas in the north, Mediterranean climates in southern Australia, and temperate or quasi-temperate areas in Tasmania and parts of eastern Australia. This diverse climate, along with its isolated nature from other continents, leads to Australia to have a high degree of diverse and unique animals. Politically, Australia is a federation divided into three main types of entities. First are the six provinces, and you'll vaguely recognize all of them. New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, Southern Australia, Tasmania, and Western Australia. Then there are the internal territories, which are generally considered to have a smaller population and less representation in the Australian Parliament than the provinces. They are the Northern Territory, the Australian Capital Territory, and the Jarvis Bay Territory. Finally, there are several external territories, which are a series of areas that Australia controls outside of the main continent. Some are unpopulated small islands, like the Ashmore and Cater Islands. Others have small populations with their own unique culture, like Norfolk and Christmas Island. Population-wise, Australia has a relatively low population for such a large country, but it's still substantial, with most concentrated around the coast, in particular the eastern coast. Australia has around 25.7 million people. Racially and ethnically, Australia is divided into three main groups, although plenty of people fall outside this grouping system. The largest of these are white Australians, who make up 76% of the population. These white Australians are mostly of English, Irish, Welsh, or other Celtic stock, although there are plenty of other white ethnic groups such as Germans, Greeks, and Dutch. There's also a large subgroup of white Australians who simply call themselves as Australians, although they usually tend to be English or Northern European. The next group is Asian Australians. This includes a wide group of East Asians, like the Chinese, Korean, and Japanese, Southeast Asians, such as the Vietnamese and Filipinos, or South Asians, like Indians and Sri Lankans. They make up around 16% of the population, and are concentrated in urban areas, with many arriving to the country in the last 60 years. Finally, there are the Indigenous Australians, or Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders. They make up a little under 3% of the population, and were the first humans to ever set foot in Australia. They are divided into hundreds of different subgroups or tribes, with many having their own distinct culture and language. They tend to be concentrated in the center of the country, the Northern Regions, and the Northern Territory. Language-wise, most people speak English with that particularly funny and famous Australian accent. Other minority groups will speak their own native languages, especially if they are first generation. Some Aboriginals will speak one or several distinct and unique Aboriginal languages. It is believed there are around 300 different Aboriginal languages throughout the continent. However, it's important to note that many of these languages are endangered, with most spoken by only a small group of older Aboriginals. Finally, let's talk religion. The majority of Australians are Christian, with 52% being Christian. Catholics who make up 23% and Anglicans who make up 14% are the largest branches of Christians. Other smaller religious groups are also present, making up 8% of the population. The largest of these are Muslims, Buddhists, and Hindus. Finally, there's a large group of Australians who just aren't religious, with 30% being irreligious. Those of you who are good at math may ask what is the remaining 10%. Well, that's a good question, and the answer is simply the Australian census numbers are whack, and for some reason 10% just wasn't stated. So on to the history. The Aboriginal Australians are believed to have reached Australia around 65,000 years ago. These Aboriginals spread out across the vast continent, with these groups all forming their own distinct cultures, customs, and languages. These tribes and people groups would all have vastly different experiences depending on what part of the country they came from. Some would live relatively peacefully with their neighbors, establishing trading connections, intermingling, and growing close. Others would have hostile relations, and war would occur, often with brutal results, as tribes were massacred and women and children were kidnapped. Aboriginals lived in hunter-gatherer societies, although there is some debate as if they used agriculture in some of the more temperate areas. Aboriginal culture has many distinct customs, although they, of course, vary depending on where you are. But one of the most famous things to come out of their culture is what is known as the Dreamtime. The Dreamtime is a combination of mythological stories, 
folklore, quasi-religious beliefs, and oral history all blended into one. The dream time is said to occur in the every time, which exists in the state of happening before the present, after the present, and during the present. I'd encourage you to look up some of the stories of the dream time just to get a better understanding of it. Before the Europeans arrived, Aboriginals were, for the most part, cut off from the rest of the outside world. The Torres Strait Islands were settled by a collection of Melanesian people who primarily live in Papua New Guinea and had limited contact with other people of Melanesia. Tribes in northern Australia had sporadic contact with fishermen and some traders, primarily from the Indonesian islands of Sulawesi and eastern Indonesia. European contact would first start when a Dutch ship spotted and landed in Australia in 1606. Several European countries and explorers would visit the continent throughout the years. They would map out much of the coast, and some countries claimed the continent as their own, although no serious attempts were made to try and create a colony. In 1783, this would all change. The British Empire had just lost their American colonies and wanted to establish a new colony so they could send convicts to this colony to take them out of England, to have it as a long-term investment and hopefully transform the colony into an economic hub and as a naval base in the Pacific. Eleven ships known as the First Fleet sailed out to Australia in 1787, bringing with them around 1,000 people to settle the new land. They would land in what would become New South Wales and begin the British colonization of Australia. These settlers would slowly start to build up their colony, with the Royal Navy sending more and more convicts to Australia. However, it's important to note that although a significant portion of these colonists were convicts, along with these convicts came freemen who simply wanted to leave England, along with British colonial administrators and British soldiers. The convicts themselves were a combination of poor petty robbers and muggers who could have been as young as 11, prostitutes, rebellious Irish nationalists, and hardcore murderers. The convicts would then often be forced to work long hours for relatively little pay, and were treated poorly by the legal system there. Supplies were also hard to come by in this faraway land, and disease was common. With a lot of new prisoners being transported to Australia, many quickly found themselves, perhaps understandably, unhappy that they'd been transported to this hellhole. Rebellion and general disobedience became an important staple of Australia during this time. In 1804, 200 Irish convicts attempted and failed to steal British warships to go back to Ireland in the Castle Hill Rebellion. Some convicts looking for a way out would choose to simply run away and escape into the wilderness and become outlaws. Keep this in the back of your mind for later. In 1808, the governor of New South Wales, William Bly, would be overthrown and would become known as the Rum Rebellion. Bly had been seen as broadly authoritarian and treated much of the convict population with disdain. With his overthrow, Lachlan McCree would be appointed governor. McCree would lead Australia towards a more liberal and free society for the convicts, and Australia started to flourish as Australia began to be seen less as a place for the British to put prisoners, and more as an actual colony, like Canada or the 13 colonies. More Europeans began to arrive to Australia, and New South Wales expanded. The European population increased more and more as industries like farming, herding sheep, whaling, and eventually mining became important parts of the Australian economy. By the 1830s, convict transportation to Australia dropped off as more and more of those arriving were free settlers. The last convicts would be brought to Western Australia in 1868. Along with this, new colonies would be set up around the continent, and British influence began to expand deeper and deeper into the country. With this expansion came conflict with the Aboriginals. Europeans had brought with them Old World diseases, and similar to the indigenous populations in the Americas, many would be killed by it. Others would be killed by violence with the Europeans. From the start of British colonization, on and off again violence would occur, as the British and Aboriginals frequently clashed over land rights, access to resources, revenge killings, and often simply misunderstandings. Violence and conflict between the two groups would last over 100 years, with the last of the so-called frontier wars occurring in 1934 with the Caledon Bay Crisis. All of these conflicts have their own unique stories, with different people, tactics, and reasons for fighting. However, most can be categorized with the British often having the upper hand, as they had superior firepower and a very different understanding of warfare from the Aboriginals. Aboriginal warfare couldn't sustain long-term and protracted conflicts, and just a couple dead Aboriginal warriors often meant a tribe was defeated and would never be able to challenge the British again. The British would on occasion be helped by other Aboriginals, as the British pitted different groups against each other. Most of these conflicts would result in the Aboriginals being placed into reservations, typically with poor farmland, limited resources, and outside of their traditional homelands. It is believed at least 45,000 people died on both sides, with some claiming the conflict constitutes as a genocide. In the 1850s, gold was found on the continent, with Victoria having a particularly high number of gold rushes. Many would travel looking to find their fortune, but life for these prospectors was difficult. They often had to pay high fees and taxes simply to mine, which forced many deep into debt or into jail. In 1854, in Belrad, Victoria, many miners unhappy with these unfair laws and a lack of political representation revolted in the Eureka Rebellion. 
Famously, these miners swore allegiance to each other and to fight for their rights. Now few of these miners had any real military experience, and two days after the swearing of allegiance, the British colonial forces had put down the rebellion. Although militarily these miners lost, they had a large amount of public support, and many of the remaining leaders would become important political figures in Victorian politics. By 1856, universal suffrage for all men in the colony was introduced, expanding democracy in Australia. Now remember those outlaws that had escaped into the Australian countryside? Well, with the gold rush, these outlaws increased dramatically as gold became a common sight, and much of the interior of Australia remained outside of the police presence. These outlaws, more commonly referred to as bushrangers, had a golden age from the 1850s up until the 1880s. Most famous of these was the outlaw Ned Kelly, who became a sort of folk hero to many. He and a gang of other bushrangers would, over the course of two years, avoid authorities, all while committing several robberies and denouncing the colonial government in Australia and its treatment towards the poor. In 1880, he would be caught after an intense police shootout where he donned a plate of armor and fought off the police for several hours. Kelly would be executed, but continues to live on in the Australian consciousness. If you want a full episode on Ned Kelly, you can check out Anthology of Heroes podcast. I'll put a link in the description. Australia had gradually started to become more democratic, as people throughout Australia demanded representation. New South Wales would be the first to have a legislative assembly, with elected members in 1843. At first, only landholding men could vote, but as the years grew by, states would begin to allow all male subjects of the British Empire to vote. Women would be given the right to vote in South Australia in 1861, and by 1908, women were allowed to vote all throughout Australia. It should be noted that Aboriginal suffrage is more complicated. While they were considered subjects of the British Empire, Queensland and Western Australia created laws to prevent Aboriginals from voting, and throughout the rest of Australia, Aboriginals were discouraged from voting and rarely informed on their rights. Starting in the 1890s, a new era emerged in white Aboriginal relations. With most Aboriginal tribes defeated militarily and forced onto reservations, Aboriginal quality of life deteriorated. Many found themselves in extreme poverty. White government officials began the policy of taking Aboriginal and mixed-race children who grew up in these poor conditions away from their family and raised them elsewhere. These children taken away will be known as the Stolen Generations, as those who were taken often lost their original names, along with all contact to their original families, and many were encouraged to be assimilated into white society. There is currently a debate today about whether this constituted as a genocide, similar to the argument over the frontier wars, as Aboriginal activists often accuse the government of trying to breed out the Aboriginals, and that these officials were proponents of eugenics. Other historians will take a more apologist position, arguing that many of the people who took these kids in simply wanted to help poor people suffering. Regardless, this policy of forced removal will continue until the 1970s, with around one-tenth to one-third of all Aboriginal children affected. By 1859, six colonies had emerged in Australia, which corresponds to the six provinces of Australia today, although I should mention South Australia at this time also controlled the Northern Territory. These six colonies began talking about federating and merging into one big colony, they would make Australia a federation, with the six colonies becoming provinces, and allowing these colonies to have a greater influence on the world stage and in the British Empire. This came at a time where nationalism and the predominance of the nation-state was powerful all throughout the world. As more Australians were born in Australia itself, they found themselves becoming more and more connected with each other, and a sense of national pride flourished. By 1901, the six colonies decided to federate, and Australia as we know it today was born. Australia still remained close with Britain, however, it was considered a dominion of the United Kingdom, with it still retaining many constitutional and political links. The monarch of England remained, and still to this day, remains as the monarch of Australia. The monarch still appoints governor generals of Australia, and does technically have some political powers there, although it is rarely used. It wouldn't be until 1986 when all constitutional links were severed, but still, Australia and the United Kingdom share in their cultural and geopolitical links. In the lead-up to Federation, there is a large debate where the capital should be located, as most of the population was on the eastern side of the country, the debate was generally centered around if it should be Sydney, New South Wales, or Melbourne, Victoria. Eventually a compromise would be reached, which resulted in the city of Canberra to be formed in 1911. This city would be built at the midpoint between the two cities. Today, it still remains as Australia's capital, although Sydney is its most famous and largest city. I want to go back a little bit and talk about another group I mentioned at the start of this video, Asian Australians. During the pre-Federation years, there was two primary groups of Asians heading to Australia. First were Chinese laborers who had started arriving in large numbers during the gold rushes of the 1850s. The second were Indian laborers who arrived after convict numbers began declining and were used to fill the manual labor shortages in the country. White and Asian Australians often had a hostile and antagonistic relationship with one another. Many were upset that Asian Australians didn't join unions, believing they effectively reduced wages for white workers. 
After Federation, a policy known as the White Australia Policy was enacted. The Australian government effectively fought to prevent any non-white people from entering the country, hoping to keep the country majority British. The Immigration Act of 1901 was infamous for forcing potential migrants to write up 50 words in a European language. The language would be chosen by the immigration officer present, meaning literally any European language could be chosen. So theoretically, you could arrive from China knowing only some passable English you learned, hoping to pick up the rest once you enter the country only for the immigration officer to demand you tell him about the weather in Bulgarian. Needless to say, Asian immigration and its population in Australia declined significantly. In World War I, Australia enthusiastically joined the Allies in the British Empire in defeating the Central Powers in 1914. First, Australia would invade German-controlled New Guinea, taking almost the entire colony by 1915. Australia would also send its forces to fight the Ottoman Empire in Iraq and Egypt, and to France to fight the Germans. The Australian Navy would use its ships to help protect British naval convoys throughout the world to stop German U-boat attacks. Australia would also be noted as one of the few countries that never used conscription during the war, with Australian forces being entirely made up of volunteers. However, the most famous campaign the Australians would fight in would be in Gallipoli. In short, the Gallipoli campaign was an attempt by the British to land troops in Monde, Turkey, and try to invade Constantinople to take the Ottomans out of the war. In early 1915, the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, or ANZAC, along with other British and French troops, would land on the Gallipoli Peninsula and attempt to push east. However, they were met with fierce Ottoman resistance and were unable to break the Ottomans' defenses. Bad planning on the Allied High Command's part also didn't help, despite Australian troops being noted for their bravery and determination in the battle. Around 9,000 Australians would be killed due to either battle or disease. By 1916, the remaining Allied forces in Gallipoli had evacuated, and although the campaign had been a failure, the campaign played an important role in shaping the national consciousness of Australians. Now let's briefly talk about Australian politics. Australian politically has been fought over since Federation by two different political parties, although there has always been some 30 party success and victories. First is the Australian Labour Party. They're considered being on the left and generally came out of the labour and union movement in the late 19th century. They initially were far more socialist, but have slowly moderated into a more social democratic party, with even some more centrist wings. The Labour Party broadly has supported unions and workers, and opposed excessive privatization and supported progressive domestic policies. On the other hand is a coalition of anti-Labour parties. Several different parties throughout Australia's history have emerged to act as the main right-wing party in Australia. In 1917, the Nationalist Party would emerge and fill this role until 1931, when it merged along with some Labour MPs into United Australia Party. This in turn would remain until 1945, when the Liberal Party was founded. The Liberal Party today is the largest centre-right party in Australia, with it seeking to represent urban and suburban middle-class conservatives, and supports the free market. It has worked closely with another party, the National Party. The National Party seeks to represent rural farmers and wants to protect their economic interests. Both parties are considered centre-right and mostly agree on everything. They have formed what is known as the Coalition, with both parties working together to prevent a Labour government. Both the Coalition and Labour Party have had their ups and downs throughout Australia's history, with both parties being in government at various points in Australia's history. After World War I, Australia's economy, like most countries, entered a period of growth. This growth would end in the 30s as the Great Depression affected the entire world. Australia suffered as the export industry that they had built up slowly began to crumble and as high as 29% of all Australians would become unemployed. The government attempted to implement more Keynesian reforms and involve the government more in the economy to alleviate those struggling. During this time of economic instability came one of the most famous and most memed events in Australia's history, the Emu War. Many farmers attempting to increase production in their fields decided to grow more wheat, which attracted large hordes of emus in Western Australia. These emus devastated farms across the region, leading to these farmers to ask the Australian government for assistance in dealing with the threat. The government sent out a small detachment of soldiers to try and eliminate the threat, but embarrassingly, they failed. The emus often separated once gunfire began, which let the vast majority of emus escape their fate. After about a month, the government had given up, thus sieging much of Western Australia to the emus, leading to the creation of the Republic of Emustan. Not really. But the government would instead offer bounties for the emus, which resulted in far more emus being killed and helping solve their emu problem. World War II would start off with Australia again joining Britain in aiding the Allies in the war against the Axis powers. Australia sent troops to aid the British in taking Vichy France Syria, along with Italian North Africa. The Australian forces were noted for being particularly fierce, earning them the nickname the Rats of Tobruk. By 1942, most Australian forces would be transferred outside of North Africa, but Australian forces would still participate in the taking of Algeria, Sicily, and southern Italy, and would fight against the Germans in Normandy, France, and Germany. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941, Australia's focus on the war radically transformed from simply aiding Britain in defeating the Germans 
to a fight for survival. While it is generally agreed upon that the Japanese weren't planning on invading Australia, the Japanese did bomb the city of Darwin, and many in Australia feared an invasion and occupation from Japan. The Australians focused much of their forces in the Pacific, participating in the defense of the British colony of Malaysia, the naval fighting across the Pacific, and the fighting in Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. The fighting in Papua New Guinea was particularly fierce and similar to the Gallipoli campaign, became a focal point in the Australian national consciousness. Around 27,000 Australians would die in the war. On the home front, one of the most important effects of the war was on women's employment. While before the war, there were women workers, the majority stayed at home. During the war, as more men were sent to fight in the front, many women decided to work in the factories, and women's employment increased rapidly. The first female member of Australia's parliament would be elected in 1943. Women would ultimately enjoy greater responsibilities because of the war, leading to more women to demand the right to be treated equally. The war would result in Australia moving geopolitically from simply a branch of the British foreign policy to a close American ally. Australia would fight in several American wars, such as the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, and the war in Iraq. Even today, Australia still has troops in Afghanistan, and has contributed to airstrikes against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Australia is considered a major non-NATO ally by the US, and the two have close relations in trade, with both countries' leaders often meeting to discuss relations. Australia would also participate in wars in Malaysia against communist insurgents, and peacekeeping operations in East Timor. Australia acts as an important regional partner across Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Australia, along with New Zealand, has been noted in providing loans and funds to many small island nations across the Pacific, increasing its soft power there. Australia also trades in high amounts with nations in the eastern half of Asia. All this has led Australia to grow economically and is considered to be one of the top economies in the world. With this economic growth, immigration into Australia has increased rapidly. At first initially, only European people moved in large numbers to Australia post-war due to the white Australia policy. As many Southeast Asian peoples attempted to flee violence at home during World War II and the Vietnam War, Australia was a natural choice for many. Australian lawmakers began to realize that without more immigration, Australia's population would shrink, and with that, Australia's wealth would as well. By the 70s, Australia began to dismantle the white Australia policy, which led to a rapid increase of new immigrants entering the country, and the Asian Australian population grew. However, today, immigration is a controversial topic in the country. Several right-wing nationalist parties have emerged to try and curb the large number of new migrants entering the country. These parties have seen mixed results across Australia. It is still a national debate on immigration if it is a positive thing for the country, and how it can be improved. Australia's policy towards refugees attempting to find asylum in the country has been particularly controversial, as Australia has held many of those attempting to flee the country in detention centres, many of which have been criticised as being inhumane. In the 60s, Aboriginal civil rights groups fought for increased rights for their people. Aboriginals were given the right to vote, and were included in the census. Land rights for the Aboriginals were given legal protection, and generally, conditions for Aboriginals improved. However, it's important to note that even today, many Aboriginals struggle. They on average have a worse education, lower life expectancy, and a higher poverty rate than non-Aboriginals. Much of Aboriginal culture has been destroyed, which has resulted in a loss of cultural identity. Today, Aboriginal interest groups have argued for increased land rights, increased political representation, and more government resources to help their community. Before we end the episode, I'll talk about some political history. In 1967, the Prime Minister of Australia, Harold Holt, went for a swim on the coast of Victoria with some friends. While swimming, he just disappeared. Like he was swimming one second, and the next he was under the water, gone. A search mission was sent out, but Holt was never found. It is generally believed that Holt drowned, but today it is rumored that he committed suicide, was killed by the CIA, killed by the North Vietnamese, or defected to China, and was secretly all along a Chinese spy. Regardless of what happened, it can be considered the Kennedy assassination of Australia, and left a defining cultural impact on the country. Another Prime Minister ending moment occurred in 1975. The Labour Prime Minister, Gott Whitlam, had just won an election gaining majority of the House of Representatives, which is the most important federal legislative body, and determines who the Prime Minister is. However, the federal Senate was split between the Labour government and the coalition opposition. When Whitlam's government attempted to pass spending bills to fund government projects, the Senate refused to pass it. This resulted in a constitutional crisis, as both parties were effectively gridlocked. Both parties turned to the Governor General, John Kerr. Now I have already explained what a Governor General was in the Antigua and Barbuda episode, but to briefly refresh your mind, it's pretty much the Queen of England's representative in Australia, and has her constitutional powers. In November 1975, Woodlam met with the Governor General and attempted to convince him to call a Senate election. Instead, the Governor General sacked Woodlam and made the leader of the opposition Prime Minister. This ultimately led to the coalition winning a landslide in the general election a month later. 
but the events of the crisis still prove to be controversial in Australia today. It is famous for being the only time a governor general used their power like this, and not just in Australian history, but also just in general. No other country with a governor general has ever had such an exciting episode with their governor general, a position usually relegated to saying hi to foreign leaders and being old. Finally, let's talk about the current prime minister, Scott Morrison. Morrison will become the leader of the ruling Liberal Party after a leadership dispute. He narrowly won an election in 2019, which to most observers looked likely to result in a Labour victory. Morrison has attempted to reduce the budget deficit in Australia and has had to deal with massive bushfires in late 2019 and the coronavirus outbreak. Also, allegedly he pooped his pants in 1997 at a McDonald's, so there's that. So why does Australia exist? Australia is a big country with a big personality. There's so many more stories and tales I could talk about with Australia. So expect a couple side episodes about this fascinating country. It's a country that was created with a mix of British colonialism, rebellious spirits, unique Aboriginal influences, and a drive for increasing freedom, and many, many fun facts. It'll continue to be an important player in Oceania for decades to come, and culturally will be a favorite the world over. Australia is a fascinating country, and I hope I was able to express that with this episode. Next time we will go northwest and into Austria. I know both Australia and Austria sound similar, but both countries' names and peoples have very different origins. Prepare for disputes about national identity, the Catholic Church, and a lot of royal inbreeding. Thank you, I hope you enjoyed. If you want to contact me, you can email me at whydocountriesexist at gmail.com for if you want to send your thoughts, comments, suggestions, or hate mail. Take care, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. The sources I use for this video are Anthology of Heroes Podcast, Episode 4, Ted Kelly, Bad and Padada's video, Aboriginal History and White Guilt, Bruce Pascola's TED Talk, a Real History of Aboriginal Australians, the First Agriculturalist, Caspian Report's videos on, on the geopolitics of Australia and understanding the Australian mindset, Feature History's video, The Eureka Stockade, Fire of Learning's documentary, Full History of Australia, Geography Now's videos, Australia and Australia's States and Territories Explained, The Grunge article, The Messed Up History of Australia's Penal Colonies, Martin Productions documentary, Gladiators of World War II, Anzacs, Mr. History's video, A Super Quick History of Australia, The National Museum of Australia's article on the White Australia Policy, Sam Onella Academy's video, The Great Emu War, Sterling Documentary's documentary, History of Convict Australia, Sabine's video, The Animated History of Australia, The Great Wars video, Born on the Shores of Gallipoli, Anzac and World War I, The Mercury article, Reports reveal suffering of children at Pointsville Detention Center, and Wikipedia.